In Hollywood this week... A little cheesecake. A little glamour. A little sentiment. While in the world of TV... ABC premieres a new soap. And introduces a new president. In the world of movies... Leonard Maltin reviews Twilight Zone. While the movie's production team faces another kind of review, criminal indictment. And in the world of music... A lot of questions. Questions about David Bowie concert tickets. And questions about Elvis. Stay with Entertainment This Week for all the answers, information, and happenings in the world of show business. For the final weekend in the month of June, 1983. everyone, the grand jury charged with determining criminal responsibility for the helicopter crash that killed three on the Twilight Zone movie set made public its findings on Friday. Scott Osborne reports. Eleven months and one day after veteran actor Vic Morrow and two small children died in the Twilight Zone helicopter crash, five men involved in making the film were charged in their deaths. Gentlemen, you and each of you are charged... Director John Landis and four other production personnel were formally charged with involuntary manslaughter. Special effects expert Paul Stewart and pilot Dorsey Wingo were charged in the helicopter crash. Associate producer George Folsey Jr. and production manager Dan Allingham were charged with illegally employing the two children who were killed. Director Landis was named in five counts. Landis, of course, is charged in all counts because uh, under our theory... Uh, we're alleging that he's responsible not only for bringing the children onto the set and alleging that he violated the misdemeanor, child endangering and child labor laws, but also that uh, because of his uh, uh, direction, we're alleging uh, that the stunts were conducted in a reckless manner. The accident was an overwhelming tragedy for many people. It's had a, a profound impact on our lives. And I know in my head and I know in my heart that we did not cause this accident. All five pleaded not guilty. They were released on their own recognizance. Ironically, Twilight Zone, the movie, opened nationwide the day the formal charges were filed. Scott Osborne, Entertainment This Week. Hollywood makes much of its living staying on top of the latest trends, but this week the community concentrated on preserving its past. The American Film Institute, RKO Pictures, and the UCLA Film Archives are sponsoring what they're calling a decade of preservation. Catherine Mann explains. These stars have motion picture history on their minds. They came to a fundraising dinner in Beverly Hills to kick off the Decade of Preservation. And organized effort to... The Decade of Preservation is being launched now because in 1993, film will be 100 years old. Nearly half of the movies made prior to 1951, when nitrate film stock was in use, are lost forever. And no way has been found yet to prevent the eventual self-destruction of those that survive unless they are transferred to modern acetate film. In terms of preserving films, why do you think it's so important? It's important because it's, uh, it's part of our culture. Personally, I grew up watching old movies. I mean, that was the main, very important part of my life. So I think anything that can be done for the preservation of these films, you know, these works of art, I think is extremely important. I could hope that they would preserve the really good ones, you know. <laughs> Which ones would that be? Well, I just heard that they're working on a little thing I did a hundred years ago called Hell's House. And we made it in six days, and I see no reason to preserve it whatsoever. <laughs> Some top stories from this week's Entertainment Wire. Metro Media, a broadcast company, and Home Box Office, the nation's largest pay TV operation, joined forces. Under the agreement, Metro Media will help finance HBO movie projects. Playwright Neil Simon filed for divorce in Los Angeles to end his nine-year marriage to actress Marsha Mason. A half-hour taped version of the CBS Morning News will be shown daily on 100 American Airlines flights beginning July 11th. 
A federal judge in Los Angeles ruled that Steven Spielberg did not pirate the idea for E.T. the Extraterrestrial from a stage play as charged in a $570 million suit. And rock musician Sly Stone was arrested in Florida this week on drug charges and for defrauding an innkeeper. Gene Wolfe talked to the arresting officer and to Stone when he was released on bail. There was a broken uh, cocaine freebasing uh, kit. Uh, there was a razor blade uh, with some white powdery substance on it. Stone remained in the Lee County Jail because no one came up with the $570 bond deposit. Finally, after a day and a half, two Fort Myers fans who only know Sly from his music came to his rescue. <laughs> Were you using cocaine? Of course not. I was asleep. Were you falsely accused? I, I don't know. I don't even know the accusation. I, I, I was there and then I was here asleep. Yeah. You don't remember what happened? Well, I, something happened with a uh, hotel bill, and uh, the group uh, had uh, uh, they had a large bill, and then they moved on. And I just happened to stay there longer, so the bill turned into mine. Are you saying the group deserted you? Oh no 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 no! They they deserted the bill. You were pretty unconscious though when they when they found you in the room. Well, that's what happens when you sleep. Yeah. Can we get your autograph, please? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Are you disappointed in yourself that you're going through another one of these incidents again? Well, no, no. After a while, I guess you get used to it. In the week's news wrap-up, NBC puts its best face forward. ABC gets in a lather about a new soap, and Hollywood looks back at Laurel and Hardy. <laughs> It's been 33 years since Laurel and Hardy made a movie, but their films are still hits around the world. This week, some of their fans and friends showed up at the old Stan Laurel home in Los Angeles to remember them on what would have been Laurel's 93rd birthday. Every comic here, and then probably every comic in show business, will tell you that they are the origin of much of what we do. And uh, it's like Shakespeare to an actor, Laurel and Hardy to a comic. You either know that or you're not... You don't belong in comedy. Schlatter, who's produced Real People and Laughing, has been developing a program about Laurel and Hardy. Like others, he spent the day collecting and swapping anecdotes about the great comedians. They were nice people, personally. Uh, and not everybody in show business is personally adorable, though some of them may be very talented. So they were, and I think their basic niceness and warmth also was communicated to uh, children and to all of us. On Monday, ABC will introduce its first new daytime soap opera in eight years. Loving is set on a university campus, but will have a lot of the old soapy ingredients. Love, greed, jealousy, and of course, lust. The programs will be produced in New York, so executives invited Mayor Edward Koch to make a guest appearance. If they write in an acceptable uh, part uh, and they don't kill me off in the same uh, show, uh, I would consider it sure. As for the regular cast, you won't know the players without a program. I'm torn and confused and idealistic and a firebrand. I'm ridiculously rich. <laughs> I'm a capitalist. I'm a Catholic priest. Presidential timber. <laughs> I'm not telling. <laughs> Meanwhile, NBC held a press tour for the nation's TV critics this week to get an idea of how their new fall primetime lineup will do. I think Manimal has some chances on NBC if they upgrade the special effects a little bit because, of course, special effects are so big in the media right now. I think the Yellow Rose on NBC has a shot at, at being another primetime soap hit. I predict the biggest hit of the season will be Hotel, which is on ABC following Dynasty on Wednesday night. On the pilots, you can't really tell. It's, it's what they do in the second and third and up through the 13 weeks that really counts. At the top of the show, we told you about the Twilight Zone grand jury indictments. Twilight Zone, the movie, opened this week coast to coast. Here's Leonard Maltin's review. I grew up watching the Twilight Zone on TV, and I remember seeing many of the classic episodes when they were first shown on Friday nights, being unable to go to sleep afterwards. Now, four talented directors have made Twilight Zone, the movie, comprising four short stories, three of which are remakes of vintage episodes. In any anthology, some segments are better than others. Here, the standout is George Miller's version of Nightmare at 20,000 Feet. John Lithgow gives a dynamic performance in the role created by William Shatner as a man who goes berserk on a turbulent airplane flight. Oh, 
Unfortunately, Twilight Zone, the movie, misses the essence of Twilight Zone, the TV series. Even Miller's airplane episode subtly changes the climax and resolution of the original to make it more obvious and much less intriguing. None of the stories gives you that wonderful sense of revelation, what I call the aha, that were the hallmark of the television show. Twilight Zone isn't bad by any means, but it's nothing special either. A far cry from Rod Serling's classic TV show, and considering the talent involved in this production, including Steven Spielberg, that's a real disappointment. On our scale of 1 to 10, I'm giving this film a 6. I'm Leonard Maltin, Entertainment This Week. Ahead on Entertainment This Week, Patricia Neal talks about the end of her marriage. My husband uh, adores another woman he has for years. Harry Belafonte holds out for the right part. You know, I'd love to do films. I'd love to do television. I'd love to do plays. But if they don't come along and, and, and say something of substance, then what's the point? And Sally Field admits an actor's life isn't easy. Every actor lives with, with total and complete neurotic insecurity. Absolutely. All this and more ahead on Entertainment This Week. On the movie scene this week, actress Diane Cannon got a star on Hollywood Boulevard. And as Scott Osborne tells us, she took it lying down. Getting a leg up on her career, Diane Cannon reclined on Hollywood Boulevard. There are too much weight, fellas. No, no, no. <laughs> the newest star on the Walk of Fame belongs to her. Fellas, too much cheesecake? <laughs> Actually, cheesecake is what made this section of Hollywood Boulevard famous. Diane Cannon's star is situated squarely in front of Fredericks of Hollywood, celebrated source of ladies' laces. <laughs> And in honor of the occasion, Ms. Cannon received a sample of Frederick's well-known wares. Some stars are honored in front of shoe stores, others in front of bookshops. You're in front of Frederick's of Hollywood. What are your true feelings about that? I chose this spot. I was given a, a many choices on Hollywood Boulevard. I walked the pavement with my bucket of popcorn one very warm afternoon, and I said, wait a minute, Frederick's of Hollywood, I cannot resist this. Well, let's face it. A Walk of Fame star in front of Fredericks of Hollywood is great, uh, exposure. Scott Osborne, Entertainment This Week. Nice job, Scott. At the top of the movie charts this week, Superman 3 took in the most money, but Return of the Jedi did best in the per-screen average that determines our Entertainment Tonight movie index. Jedi had an ET index of $11,000 plus per screen for first place. Superman 3 earned $13.3 million at more than 1,700 theaters for an ET index of about $7,600. War Games took third place with an ET index of just over $5,500. In fourth place, Octopussy with an ET index of more than $5,100 per screen. And the comedy Trading Places took fifth place with an ET index of just over $5,000. One of the stars of Trading Places is Eddie Murphy. And in spite of his success in movies, Eddie has no plans to give up TV, especially on Saturday night. Barbara Hauer has this report. What are you looking at? Turn the channel. <laughs> Nobody in their right mind would change the channel on Eddie Murphy, unless, of course, they don't have a sense of humor. Those who do will be glad to know that he signed for another season of Saturday Night Live where he's probably the only person who could get away with telling Stevie Wonder how to act like Stevie Wonder. The secret to doing Stevie Wonder is that... You gotta, you gotta smile a lot like this, you see, you gotta smile. You mean like this? Kind of. Like this? That's almost it, you ain't really got it yet, though. Uh, then you gotta move your neck around, Stevie move your neck. Okay, how Move your neck like somebody choking you, like this. Comedy is what I, I like to do. I don't know if I could have been a successful singer or something like that, because I could carry a note, but I, it's not like, hey, I'm going to throw my shirt up at that guy. Um, I, I, can, I like to make people laugh. It's fun to me. What do you do for laughs? I look in the mirror naked. I don't know. What do I do? I drive around in my, um, my car and hang out with my friends and just be natural, you know, just get away from the show business.
It isn't easy for Murphy to get away from show business because everybody keeps talking about him. He won rave reviews in his screen debut, 48 Hours, and just as the talk started to simmer down, he came up with a new hit, Trading Places. No, I believe I can hang out with you fellas for a little while. Excellent. Yeah. I'm Randolph Duke. How you doing, Randy? What's happening? My younger brother, Mortimer. Hey, Marte, what it is? <laughs> Sometimes me and my friends just sit around and go, you know, you're really, you're really getting famous, Eddie, and it's like, yeah. But you don't try to figure it out, you accept it. It's like, you don't know what, what makes people like it. Being a movie star and a TV star doesn't keep Murphy from going back to where it all began, the comic strip in New York. This is where he was discovered, and it's still a good testing ground for new material, such as his parody of James Brown. Uh, I don't think James can get much higher than the song. He cut it and the band got to jump in on for it. One, two, three, uh, band jump in and he said, ha, ha. <laughs> yeah. Hey, man, you. Lots of them want the people to know you're there. And the band, you're what James say, man? <laughs> what would you do if you woke up one morning and found that performing was no longer fun? I wouldn't quit because I'm not... It's not like that. I think I went to college for like a month, so if I quit, it'd be like, yeah, I quit show business. Um, bring the cars in this way. <laughs> so I, I don't, I'm not going to quit show business. I don't think I'll wake up and it'll be gone. I don't think I'll wake up and it'll stop being fun. This is what I like to do. <laughs> Sally Field found herself playing an unusual movie role this week, one with some very close family ties. Gene Wolfe has the details. Hi, I'm Sally Field, and I'm an actress. This is my brother. Hi, I'm Rick Field. I'm a physicist. Yes, and we are here at the University of Florida, where my brother is a professor of physics. The movie star who never went to college is helping her brother raise funds for his work and touring the campus. I never had these years. I went right to work at 17. It still seems to be something that I missed and kind of a romantic and mysterious thing. And everyone says, what, are you crazy, Fields? When you meet professors of physics and people who are doing well, what we call important things, does it make what you do seem unimportant in any way? Acting? No. No, it really doesn't. I see films that have a tremendous impact. For instance, Norma Ray. I think I have the ability to reach people to um, change some things. Though Sally won an Oscar for Norma Ray, she's still not sure she's what she considers a success. My vision of success always has been um, not a couple of performances or a couple of years. My vision of success is Katharine Hepburn or um, Colleen Dewhurst even. I'm just starting to, to do it. After three TV series, she made her film debut in Heroes. Since then, she's done a range of roles from four Burt Reynolds films to Sybil. Norma Ray confirmed her reputation as an accomplished actress, and Absence of Malice brought positive attention. But her last two films, Back Roads and Kiss Me Goodbye, were not received well. Now she's formed her own production company. I'm trying to find the kind of film I want to be in and to get that kind of film made. It's, and it's a very curious development for me because I feel so confident as an actress now, and the actor in me thinks, eh, I don't think I want to work with that producer. They don't know enough. They're not good enough. And that producer's me. So I, th I think, wait a minute, I've got to, the producer side of me has got to catch up with the actor side of me. Do you yes. share the feeling that almost every actress I've ever met shares, which is that feeling of deep down? I'm losing it. Do you go through times oh. of that? Oh, absolutely. Every actor lives with, with total and complete neurotic insecurity absolutely every day every day I feel that the moments are slipping away my thighs oh my god my thighs you know I mean it's just silliness but real it's you know it's there very much absolutely coming up next Mary Fran she quit the soaps and waited for the right show and Newhart is it and Ted Shackelford, the co-star of Knott's Landing, speaks out about his favorite causes.
the ratings-conscious world of television, New Heart, the CBS show, which did well from its start last season, did even better last week. It moved into first place in the Nielsen's, one of three new shows to make the top five. Knight Rider, NBC's new series, came in second. The long-running CBS show, Trapper John M.D., scored third. The A-Team, another of NBC's new series, came in fourth. And Cagney and Lacey, which CBS has canceled, came in fifth. Well, Newhart's move into first place is good news for Mary Fran. She's been a weathercaster, a soap star, but she quit all of that and decided to hold out for the right part. Catherine Mann has more about Bob Newhart's new TV wife. Newhart, one of last season's more successful shows, marked the return of one of TV's most popular stars, Bob Newhart. The show is also helping to make a star out of Mary Fran. Mary and Bob play husband and wife, co-owners of a small New England inn. George can get us a piano for practically nothing. George can get us a lot of things we don't need. <laughs> oh, honey, don't you think it would be great to have one in the lobby? Their TV home is not that much different from Mary's real home, although it's some 3,000 miles away. Los Angeles has been Mary's home since she left the Midwest, where she first got her break in the business. Not as an actress, but as a weathercaster for a St. Louis TV station. I knew nothing about the weather, nor did I have any big interest in learning. I just thought it would be a way to get me on my feet to really start working professionally, and that's why I accepted that. But I also kept acting in plays there. So it wasn't as if all of a sudden I thought, now I'm going to change careers. She eventually wound up in Los Angeles, where she was cast in Days of Our Lives and stayed for four years. Then she decided it was time to move on. Why did you step away from Days of Our Lives on your own? I had enjoyed that time, and I really had enjoyed creating that character. Um, they gave me a wonderful role to play and many terrific things as an actress to explore. It wasn't as if there was something wonderful waiting for me. Um, I just felt very certain about the decision. And even in the disappointments that followed at times, the things that didn't work out, and I, in retrospect now I'm glad they didn't because I would not be doing this show right now. Jo uh, Joanna, you, you sit down. Dick, I don't know how to play anything. She did wait things out, turning down numerous projects she didn't feel were suited for her. Her wait paid off with Newhart. I wanted the audience to see a real loving couple. A couple who truly enjoyed each other, had fun with each other, had a lot of laughs together. I also wanted you to see that she was very amused by him. That she took a lot of delight in him. What would be the best of all possible worlds for you? First, to continue working. It's very important to keep the muscle moving and exercised in good things, in quality things. Only the things that, first of all, are really going to help you grow as an actress. I believe that. Secondly, that are fun. <laughs> this is going to be great! TV producer Aaron Spelling had a very special night this week, and Dixie was there to bring us this story. A big crowd assembled in Beverly Hills to do honor to one of Hollywood's most successful producers, Aaron Spelling, the man behind shows like Dynasty, Love Boat, and Heart to Heart. Spelling received the Humanitarian Award from the Retinitis Pigmentosa Foundation, which looks to the stars to help raise money. I'm so glad that so many people showed up because they'll help start the organization. They're starting a new medical center, and this is very important to them. Many of Spelling's friends praised his contributions to the television industry. He currently has six shows in the ABC primetime lineup. He's definitely a very talented man about material. He really knows what to do. He's kept a lot of very good people working. How do you do anything for Aaron Spelling? He's the greatest guy alive. He has an imagination that, that defies my imagination. Most of Spelling's shows deal with power and wealth, shows which in turn have made Spelling and his wife Candy powerful and wealthy themselves. What else makes Spelling's formula work? It's entertainment. Oh, I, I think in any recession, uh, people want to see how the other half lives. Wouldn't we all like to at least live like that for a day? Yes. <laughs> Not Landing co-star Ted Shackelford is an actor who believes in working hard, whether it's on his series or on behalf of his favorite cause. Dale Haramoto has that story. 
37-year-old Ted Shackelford was born in Oklahoma City and has a theater background. When he's not playing Gary Ewing on TV's Knott's Landing, he's one of the most outspoken actors around. The thing is that it's over with, don't you? look, man, hold it, wait a sec! Hi, I'm Ted Shackelford in Yosemite for the Sierra Club. Shackelford volunteered to be a spokesperson for the Sierra Club's public service announcements because, he says, he doesn't like what's happening to our natural resources. The industry gets away with so much garbage, it's, it's ridiculous, because the fines are nothing. It's all a big legal game that the lawyers play out. So nobody cares about being fined for polluting. Don't you think you could do more for the environment if you were involved in politics? No, I don't trust it. I don't trust politics or politicians or anything about it. Whenever he can, he walks his dogs in the Southern California mountains near his home. Solitary time that's important to him. I don't have a lot of free time. I mean, I probably work twice as much as people who work 9 to 5. My hours are 12, 14 hours a day. And that's not only just when I'm doing the series. There are other things I do, so I don't have a lot of free time. When he wound up his busy shooting schedule for Knott's Landing last season, his character was entangled in a racy plot with Abby Cunningham, played by Donna Mills. Well, some of the, the sort of bedroom scenes in Knott's Landing are pretty steamy. Do you oh, think... Well, you should have seen them before they were cut. They were great. <laughs> I, I get too far away. Yes, right? uh, yeah. we can, uh, listen, we can also slide Ted down toward the end of the Thank bed, which might help a little bit. Well, no entertainment medium presents a realistic approach to sex, unless, unless you're dealing with a documentary. I mean, even pornography, that's not realistic. Uh, so no, no, of course not. Television is not a realistic medium anyway. He's got an opinion about almost every subject, even about how his TV role might hurt his career. It can be kind of dangerous because you get typed as that person over there, as Gary Ewing, and they don't let you play anything else. This, this idea in the public said that all actors just sort of sit back and they get these offers and they look at them and say, oh, I'll pass on that, give me something better. Well, it doesn't happen that way. There may be five or six people who are able to do that. Uh, I ain't one of them. Coming up, Patricia Neal. She's come home to the U.S. to begin life on her own. And Cheech and Chong, they're moving to Europe. For a while, anyway.